Thank you. Uh, is the mic working? Yep. Okay, good. So uh, I'm Larry Hastings, and this is Python's infamous gill. I'm going to talk about the gill. I'm going to talk about what it is, um, what problem it's trying to solve, how it solves it, what the ramifications of those choices are, uh, what its history is like, and what its future is like. And uh, I originally proposed this talk uh, at being a bit of a more of an advanced level. And the way that I wrote it, it's really kind of friendly for beginners, too. So uh, don't get scared. So let's run the, back, the clock back to 1992. Python is about two years old. Um, it was still young and fresh and evolving rapidly. It was mostly used around CWI, where Guido was working. Uh, but it had also been in, released on the internet. Uh, there was a new technology out there uh, in operating systems, something called multi-threading. This isn't something that people uh, had dealt with very much to date. It was uh, seen on Mach. I think it was available on SunOS. Uh, most operating systems didn't support it. Uh, it was in the betas for the new operating system from uh, Microsoft called Windows NT. Uh, but this multi-threading, what it was, is it was kind of like multi-process, except that it was all in one process. You had multiple threads of execution happening inside of the same process of all the, the same shared state. Uh, people wanted to try experimenting with threads in Python. Uh, but you couldn't just start adding threads and expect everything to work. Um, there was going to be a problem. The first problem is uh, globals. So a global in C is kind of like a module attribute in Python. Um, it's something, there's only one of them, and everybody knows where it is. If you have multiples of these threads and are all trying to talk to the same global variable, um, you're probably going to have problems. As an example of one of these uh, globals in Python, um, there's a pointer to the current executing frame object. And that's, there's one of them, and it's a global variable, and everybody can see it. If multiple people tried to play with the frame object pointer, you'd have trouble. An even worse problem, though, is uh, reference counting. So Python uses a technique called reference counting to manage the lifetimes of objects, um, to destroy them when nobody's interested in them anymore. And I'm going to do a deep dive right now about what reference counting is, how it works, and how, what the ramifications are of reference counting is with uh, multi-threading. So reference counting. Inside of the Python interpreter at runtime, every single Python object starts with these two fields. Um, the second one is the type of the object, and the first one is what's called the reference count. This is an integer, and this integer tells you how many people are interested in this object right now, how many people are holding references. So if the reference count is three, that means that there are three pointers pointing at this object. And what you do with this reference count is, every time you take a new reference to the object, you increment that number, and every time you are no longer interested in the object, you decrement that number, so you incref and decref. When the object count, uh, reference count drops to zero, Nobody's interested in this object anymore, and so you should destroy it. You call the dunder dell if it's got a dunder dell, and you release the memory, either giving it back to the operating system or uh, recycling it and using it for another object. So in C, there are these things called macros. This is kind of like a, a subroutine call, but it's actually done as a, more of a textual substitution. So incref and decref are how you manage the reference count inside of C. Um, these are what they look like today. The ones in 1992 looked much the same. So let's look at what happens if we have two threads that are trying to deal with the reference count at the same time. I'm going to show it to you in exhaustive detail, and I'm going to show it to you both when it works and when it fails. Now, thread one and thread two both have references to this object in the center, and they're both going to drop their references, so they're both calling decref. Let's turn the decref into the underlying C, but even this isn't deep enough. We actually have to go one level deeper and look at the assembly language that this was compiled into by the C compiler. Um, this is actually just pseudo-assembly language, uh, but this is very uh, accurate to what's actually going on. So uh, let's say that the object has a reference count of three. Thread one loads that reference count into something called AX. AX is a register on the uh, CPU, and um, you can think of it as a variable. Uh, each thread has its own set of registers, effectively, so they get swapped around. So thread one loads the value of three into AX. It then decrements it, so now it's two, and it stores it back into the object, the reference count, and the object is now two. Thread two comes along, does the same thing, loads it into AX, decrements it, and stores it, and now the reference count on the object is one. This worked. We have two threads, they both drop their references, the reference count on the object dropped to one. Now let's do it again, but this time we're gonna do those, object, those things in a different order. Thread one loads it, and now it shows it three. Thread two does it at the same time, almost at exactly the same time as thread one does it, and it also sees three. Thread one decrements, so does thread two. Thread one stores, so does two. 
but thread two and thread one both wrote the same value. Both threads dropped their references. It should have dropped from three to one, but it only drops from three to two. This is a bug. Uh, this is what's called a race condition. Both of the threads were racing along, and they kind of stepped on each other's feet. Now, um, you have the inverse problem with incref. If you have two threads that both incref the object at the same time, then the uh, reference count can be one too um, small. Um, the problem here, uh, you get different results depending on which it is. If you have the reference count too large, then what happens is if everybody releases their references to the object, um, the reference count is still positive, it's one or more, and nobody has references to the object, so nobody's ever gonna clean it up. So now this is leaked memory, and if there is a finalizer and it has resources, those finalized uh, resources never get finalized, and you're leaking resources too. Um, the, uh, the inverse problem is much worse. If the reference count is too low, then let's say that it's two, and there are three people who have references to it. The first guy drops, and it drops to one. The second guy drops, and it drops to zero, and it goes away. We now clean up the object. We release the memory either back to the operating system or, re or uh, reuse it. Um, but there's still one guy who has a reference to this memory. He thinks it's a valid object. What's he going to see? If the memory's been given back to the operating system, the program will just crash. If it's been recycled to use for another object, he's going to see garbage values. He might crash. He might compute some inaccurate result. Who knows? But this is a really nasty bug, and it's really hard to debug. So getting your reference count numbers are wrong is uh, really painful. So we want to prevent this from happening if we're going to make Python multi-threaded. So the, uh, the first uh, approach that one might think of would be to add locks around everything. A lock is something you use in multi-threaded programming to prevent multiple people from using something at the same time. You can think of it as kind of like being a bouncer. There's a bouncer standing at the bar, um, and he only lets one person inside at a time. So the first person comes along, he says, go on in. The second person comes along, and they have to wait until the first person comes back out, and then the bouncer says, okay, now you can go. So we could throw a lock around every single global thing. We could say, in order to use the frame pointer, you have to be holding this lock. In order to be hold, or maybe we could do it for groups of things together. We could group together all the stuff that's for the runtime currently executing stack frame. And we also would need at least one, maybe more than one lock for reference counts. And the problem with using multiple locks like this is you have a special kind of race condition called the deadlock. So let's say that we have two threads here. This is an example of a deadlock. Um, a and B are locks. And thread one and thread two are going to try and use those locks. The problem is that they grab them in the opposite order. So thread one grabs A, then B. Thread two grabs B, then A. And the problem is if you execute them in this order. Lock, thread one tries to get lock A, and that works fine. Thread two tries to grab lock B, that works fine. Now thread keeps going. Thread one keeps going and tries to grab lock B. Nope, it has to wait. Thread two tries to grab lock A. Nope, it has to wait. These two threads are now deadlocked. They will never make progress. And if any other thread comes along and says, I want thread A, or lock A, or lock B, it's going to get stuck too. This is a deadlock. This is another painful thing in multi-threaded programming. You don't want to have this problem. So Guido, very carefully, in 1992, very cleverly, created something called the GIL. That's it. That is the interpreter lock. Since it's global to the whole uh, Python running process, we call it the global interpreter lock, or the GIL for short. Um, that's what it looked like in 1992, um, almost two years to the date, by the way, since uh, the Python repository was created. If you want to see what it looks like today in Python 2.7, that's it. It really hasn't changed uh, in uh, whatever this is, 23 years. In Python 2.7, anyway, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, now, in order to interact with the Python interpreter uh, to do anything, you have to be holding the interpreter lock. In order to interact with an object, in order to run Python bytecodes through the interpreter, you have to hold the GIL, um, which is um, both good and bad. So let's talk about the good. This is simple. Uh, simple is easy to get right. Um, because it's part of the Python C API, extension modules have to hold the GIL in order to interact with the Python interpreter. This made it a very simple rule, and it was very easy for extension authors to get right. This led to py people writing lots of extension modules for Python. The story of the Python GIL is really the story of the success of Python. People who hate the GIL don't understand Python's history. Without the GIL, Python would not have been as successful as it is today. So also, because you only had one GIL, you can't have a deadlock because there aren't two locks that you have to deal with. Now, if you have IO bound thread, uh, IO bound code, if uh, you have multiple threads and they're all blocking on IO, then this also just works magically. Your program runs as fast as it can. If your program is CPU bound, uh, then uh, your program is effectively single-threaded because, again, only one 
um, thread can hold the gill at a time, and therefore only one thread can be interacting with the Python interpreter. So if you have three threads that all want to be running code, only one of them can do it at a time, therefore you're effectively single-threaded. We're going to talk about that. That's why people don't like the gill. Now about this, uh, the reason that it works magically for IO-bound code, um, there's, a, there's another one of these macros. It's uh, two of them, actually. Pi begin allow threads and pi end allow threads. So Guido realized, if you're going to go off and do some long computation in C, if you're going to be calculating some long Fibonacci number or you're going to be blocking on I.O. or something, you're not going to be interacting with the Python interpreter, you might as well drop the gill. Let somebody else use it for a while, and then you can go and grab it again when you need it. So that's what these macros do. And these are, again, very easy to use. You can use them in extension modules. They're used all over in the Python source code. Anytime you're going to do something that might take a while, drop the gill, do your thing, grab it again. So what's the examples of these things? If you're going to go to sleep, obviously you don't need the gill. If you're going to read or write from a file handle, you can drop the gill. If you're going to read or write from a socket, you can definitely drop the gill, because that could take who knows how long. But sharing the gill in CPU-bound code, that doesn't work. Now, the gill didn't change, like I said, for a very long time. Um, in 2009, David Beasley gave a presentation at a Chicago area uh, Python user group. David Beasley is a computer researcher. He loves Python, and he's very interested in the Gill, so he's played with it a lot. And he discovered some things that were kind of awful. So first of all, um, when you have uh, multiple threads that are trying to use the Gill, there's an internal thing in Python. Um, I should have put it on the screen. It's not there. It's called the sys.set check interval and sys.get check interval. Um, this is a number that's set to 100. And what that says is, every 100 bytecodes, the currently running thread is supposed to say, OK, let somebody else have a turn. That doesn't work. Um, here is a diagram showing two threads running at the same time. They're both CPU bound. They both want to use the gill all the time they can. And um, you can see that little arrow there. That's 66,000 ticks. This is 667 times longer than it was ever supposed to be. This checkerboard was supposed to be like t -t 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 tiny little slices, and they're running for a very long time. So people aren't releasing the gill when they're supposed to. But it gets worse. <laughs> if you have two threads, and one of them is I.O. bound, and the other one is CPU bound, what you want is the, the, the I.O. bound thread doesn't run for very, very often, and it doesn't run for very long. You know, it does a little work and then it waits on a socket. And then it does a little more work, and it waits on a socket. You want to let that thing run whenever it's ready to run. So if you have a CPU-bound thread and an I.O.-bound thread in the same process, you want to prefer the I.O.-bound thread. Here, the CPU-bound thread is getting all the time, and the I.O.-bound thread never gets to run. This is what's called priority inversion in the world of uh, operating system schedulers. And uh, Python has it in a really bad way. The problem is this code that's supposed to be releasing the gill and letting other people have a chance to run. So this is it. Um, what it does is this pi thread state swap thing, that's this macro that we saw before, this pi um, allow begin thread, or what it was called, and thread and begin thread. So this is releasing the gill here. Then we say, other threads can run now. And then the immediate next thing we do is acquire the lock. So what was really happening is if we have two threads, and this one is, it has the gill right now, and this one wants it, he's saying, you can have the gill. Oh, I take it back. You can have the gill. Oh, I take it back. This guy never gets a chance to get the gill. And it's worse. If he's CPU bound, he never has a chance. And if he's IO bound thread, he, he's never got a chance. So um, this, by the way, is still what Python 2.7 is like. This is Python 2.7. It was fixed in Python 3 in 2009 by Antoine Petrou. He wrote what's called the new gill, which is only a minor change to the gill. Um, it added a new variable called gill drop request, which is uh, something called the condition variable. In effect, this is a flag. Uh, if the second guy is trying to grab the gill and he's not getting it, he sets this flag and says, look, there's somebody waiting. You really have to give it up. And then the first guy who releases it, he releases it and he looks and he sees this flag is set and he says, oh, I really have to back off and let other people have a chance. So with this change in place, the really bad behavior that David Beasley was saying is fixed. There are still funny conditions that you can arrive at where um, you can still starve threads uh, for CPU time and uh, never getting the gill, but it's a lot less bad now. And to fix those really funny conditions would make, uh, would require making the gill a lot more complicated. Um, and what we're really talking about at this point is writing a scheduler. And uh, I only know a little bit about operating system research, but I can tell you that writing a scheduler is very complicated. And the more fair you want to make it, the harder the problem it becomes. And this is really kind of a, a rat hole that we don't want to go down in the Python uh, source tree. So um, the plan was we were going to try a gill this way and see if it worked okay. And basically, it's been fine, and we just want to leave it alone. 
So this is the guild that's in, two seven, in uh, three, two, and above, I think. Now, meanwhile, while we haven't been paying attention to all this, the world has kind of changed around us. So I remind you, Python itself was written in, 2000, in uh, 1990, uh, originally created in 1990, and multithreading was added in 92, I think. Uh, now, you didn't see multiple cores, you didn't see multiple CPUs in a computer very often back then. You'd have to actually go and get a second CPU and have both of them on the motherboard. I had a computer like that in 1995, 96. I had two Pentium 133s in one single computer, but I was kind of a weirdo. You didn't really see it prevalent until you had multiple cores on a single CPU, and you didn't see that until about 2005. That's when server CPUs and desktop CPUs, and actually the CPUs used in game consoles for the home, those all went multi-core in 2005. And that's when we started really seeing a lot of uh, uptick in uh, multi-core use in programming. Laptops themselves went uh, multi-core in 2007. Tablets and phones and systems on a chip that are embedded in very small projects, those all went multi-core in about 2011. Eyeglasses went multi-core in 2013. <laughs> watches went multi-core in 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, eyeglasses and wristwatches are now multi-core. We live in a very multi-core world and we still don't have a solution for running Python on multiple cores simultaneously. Now, uh, Guido has talked about this. He wrote a blog post uh, back in 2007. He said, um, and he said, by the way, Python 3K, that's the old name for Python 3. Um, he said, I'd welcome a set of patches in the Py 3K only if the performance for a single-threaded program and for a multi-threaded but I.O.-bound program does not decrease. This is a tall order. It's been almost eight years. Nobody has done it. We're not sure how to do it. People have tried in the past. There was a famous patch uh, back in the Python 1.4 days called the free threading patch. Um, what it did, it didn't require changing the C API, which is good. Um, it took all of those global variables, like the pointer to the current frame, um, it sucked them all into one single dict, um, or a struct, excuse me, a C struct, which is roughly equivalent to a Python class. So now you could have more than one of them. So he created one per thread, and now they didn't stomp on each other. And then he added a single uh, lock, a mutual exclusion lock, around incref and decref. So you had to be holding this lock in order to do an incref or a decref. And so you would grab it, do your plus or minus, and release it. This added so much overhead that performance is terrible. It was, about, it was between four and seven times slower. And this is results based on uh, David Beasley reviving this, this uh, patch like 10 years later. Uh, a couple of years ago, a guy named Antoine Petru, who's around the conference today, um, he tried something um, using atomic test and set. So modern computers actually have a machine language instruction that is a single instruction that says, subtract one from this value over here. So you remember those three instructions, load, decrement, and, and store. It combines those into a single instruction, which it guarantees will happen atomically, and you'll never have any problems of races. So that's good. Um, it doesn't require any API changes, which is also good but it makes it 30% slower. So again, it doesn't meet the bar that Guido was talking about. Now here's something to consider. There are four big Python interpreters in the world. There's CPython, and then there's everybody else. CPython has a gill, everybody else doesn't. CPython uses reference counting, everybody else doesn't. What do the other people use? They use something called garbage collection, mark and sweep garbage collection. You can, if you, if you have uh, garbage collection, you don't need the gill nearly as much. It's very easy to say, okay, we can get around it. Um, PyPy actually has a little bit of a gill that they just use during garbage collection cycles. They say it wouldn't be that, you know, it'd be kind of a pain to get rid of it, but it's not impossible. It's impossible to get rid of the gill as long as we're using reference counting. So people say, we should go to garbage collection with Python, okay? The problem with that is that that changes the API. We change, um, so, in order to talk to the Python interpreter you call the C API, in order to deal with objects in the C API, you have to understand Python's memory management approach. So C, external programmers have to know incref and decref. If we got rid of those and changed to uh, garbage collection, that changes the API. That breaks every extension out there. There are a lot of extensions for Python. We don't want to break them. So I'm not sure that we can do this. Would it be any slower? Would it be faster? Um, conventional wisdom, or at least told to me by Michael Ford, uh, is that um, garbage collection and reference counting are roughly the same, but we wouldn't actually know until we did it. And it would be a lot of work, and uh, nobody has been uh, gutsy enough to try. Here's something else to consider, though. So all of the major languages that have come out since Python was invented, like you know the JVM, 
uh, for Java and the CLR for uh, C Sharp, all, uh, Rust and Go, all of these things are using garbage collection. Also, all of them don't have C APIs. PyPy doesn't have a C API either. Now, why is that? Well, the obvious reason is that these languages are generally considered about as fast as C. So the reason for writing a C extension to speed things up, you don't need it. Um, they all have the ability to call out into a C library. And so um, maybe they think that, well, you just don't need it. You know, you can call out to a C library and you don't need the optimization of an extension, so we don't need the C API. But another thing to consider is that, like I've just said, having a C API means exposing your memory management model to the world, which means that now your hands are tied. If you change that memory management model, you break everybody's C extensions. If they don't expose the memory management model to the world, they are now free to change it internally. PyPy started out with a simple mark and sweep, I think. He can correct me. Um, it started out with simple mark and sweep, and over time it became generational and became an incremental collector. And Armin told me that um, the change to incremental wouldn't have broken anybody's code. The change to generational probably would have. If they had exposed the C API, they would have been free to make those changes, and PyPy wouldn't have the better man memory manager that it does. So if C Python switched to garbage collection, again, this would break every C API out there, and then if we made improvements to it later, we might break everybody again. So in my opinion, um, I think that if we went to the route of trying to change to a garbage collection, we should probably give up on having a C API, which again, we break everybody's C extensions and we don't fix them again. Instead, we say, rewrite your extensions in Python and use CFFI, which by the way is wonderful because then that lets you run on PyPy and also Jython and IronPython are talking about um, CFFI support. So this would mean that your extensions were now portable across Python implementations. I think polit for political reasons, the only thing that we could really talk about is atomic test and set. And even with the 30% speed loss, um, I think that the pressure for supporting multi-core is going to get big enough that we're really gonna have to look at doing this. That's it. So the, the coffee break has started. So if you're, uh, if you're jonesing for a cup of coffee, um, you can take off. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer questions for a couple minutes until they kick me out. Uh, somebody is holding up their hand up on the aisle in the center. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you very much for this awesome talk. Um, so you say one of the main problem with a garbage collector is C extensions. But what if uh, somehow mark the code as pure Python code that doesn't interact with the C extensions, and there you can, with those objects, you can, you can do garbage collection. And somehow mark that the code that interacts with the C extensions, and there use GIL or atomic increments, decrements. Because like there is a lot of uh, pure Python code out there. Okay. That, uh, wh why, not, why not use garbage collection there? Thanks. Python code that runs in Python? doesn't care about whether it has a garbage collector or whether it's uh, reference counted. So I kind of didn't un understand your question. Maybe you're going to have to clarify it. But I will point out to you that CPython has reference counting, and all the other Python implementations use garbage collection, and your code still runs either way. So it doesn't matter. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Uh, I mean, imagine you have a pure Python program that doesn't interact with any uh, C extensions. What prevents having a garbage collector there? Nothing. You can run it today because you can run it under Jython or Iron Python or PyPy, and those have pure garbage collection. They don't have. No, I mean, what, why not to implement it within C Python? I'm sorry. Why not to implement it within C Python? Uh, why not implement it in C Python? Because that breaks all of the C extensions, and people use C extensions all the time. Yeah. And, and, and to provide a, a data point for this. It, can I interrupt, Larry? Sure. That, so um, Resolver Systems at one point implemented something called Ironclad, which was um, an implementation of the Python C API for Iron Python. And uh, Iron Python doesn't have a gill and it doesn't use reference counting. But all of the we maintain binary compatibility with the existing um, with existing binaries because this was for Windows and people basically basically can't compile their own extensions there. And so what you have with those existing binaries is you have um, C objects, effectively Python objects, implemented in C that expects to use reference counting. Um, um, 
And so um, we had a hybrid system. We art objects that were returned from the C extension, we artificially inflated their reference counting by one so that the, the macros compiled into the binaries would never be triggered by getting down to zero. Uh, and then we had a, a, a proxy object that um, if, if garbage collection was entered for this object, then we would, um, then we would trigger reference ca counting for the, um, we would decrement the reference count to zero. Um, technically, we had a leak though, because if you pass in references to Python objects the, um, to the C extension, the C extension could keep references to those alive. And that, essentially what Larry is saying is that if you move to something like mark and sweep for the main Python C interpreter, those C objects are opaque to the, the garbage collector. It can't know what internal references you have. That's, that's kind of what you're saying, isn't it, Larry? Yeah. Un unless you change the API. Right, so Python actually supports garbage collection. CPython does support garbage collection, but it's only used in a very small way. It's used to break uh, reference count cycles, and most objects don't bother to implement it. So if you had uh, an object that you created in the C extension, it might have references to other objects, and you have no visibility inside of it. Um, the, the world that he lived in with Iron Python was a little different, where they were running inside of the CLR, and the CLR knows everything. In the C runtime environment, uh, we really know nothing about the memory that's been allocated. I mean, in practice, we had no memory leaks that we could find from objects, uh, from C extensions keeping other objects alive or those objects be, um, dying when the, the C extension. But that was only in practice, it seemed like it worked. So you, you kind of want your system to be theoretically tight, not just working by accident most of the time. <laughs> yes. So I guess the, the answer to my question is no, but is it possible that two threads think that the gil is free? They no. claim it and then something strange no. happens? The, 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 the lock objects are provided by the operating system and they're very good. So uh, one, one thread grabs the, the lock and the operating system does a very good job of only one, allowing one person to have it at a time. Yeah, it's not fast. It's, it depends on the operating system, actually. Like, Linux has what they call the Futex, and I think uh, uh, Python may use Futexes on uh, Linux, so that is very fast. Uh, it depends on the operating system. Some locks are actually pretty slow. But we live in 2015. I think all of them are fast these days. Yeah. Hi. Uh, what do you think is the feasibility of having a CPython uh, clone interpreter that, that breaks the C API and you use it when the extensions have caught up? So uh, you're talking about forking the Python interpreter and going to garbage collection for that? Yes, certainly you wouldn't... That's possible. I'll point out to you that... Um, we're in 2015, and C Python 3.0 came out in, what, 2008? And there are a lot of C extensions that still haven't caught up here. So people are very slow to adjust to changes to the C API. Um, and I worry that the change to garbage collection would be even worse than the change from Python 2 to Python 3. So um, I'm not optimistic about uh, making a fork of Python that has pure garbage collection and everyone's saying, oh, I want to switch over to that, and it's and it really taking. I mean, at some point, uh, you make so many changes, it isn't recognizable Python anymore, and you might as well switch to PyPy, because those guys have been doing it for a long time, and it kind of works, mostly. Okay, I think everybody wants to go to coffee. Thank you.